CES 2019 is in the books. It was four days of wonderful, technological, amazing stuff. I was there for two days and I did get to see some stuff and I wanna talk about it right here on 3D Printing Nerd. I was very fortunate to get the chance to go to CES 2019 this year. My badge was provided by Ivy 3D and I got to stay at one of the founders of Haddington Dynamics. His name is Kent. Kent and his wife and his kids, wonderful people, got to stay in their house. Haddington Dynamics was at the Mark Forged booth with their Dexter robotic arm. This arm is a seven axis machine that is actually an example of their motion control software. Haddington Dynamics, as they'll tell you, is not a robot arm company. They're a software company. Their software can drive that seven axis robotic arm to precision that it boggles the mind. Plus, it's interesting to think that you could take motion control software and adapt it to a 3D printer, which would mean you could print faster and more accurately. So I hope that gets the chance to happen. But while we were at CES, James of Haddington Dynamics did try to make Dexter pick up the Joelbot and its little gripper tried to grab Joelbot's head and it, it didn't work out too well. Eventually, we got the gripper to go around and grip Joelbot by the legs and pick him up and shake him around, kind of like King Kong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That was a lot of fun. The Mark Forge booth was actually one of the more popular booths and the arm was definitely the bell of the ball in that booth. Really close to the Mark Forged booth was the Form Labs booth. And I thought I would stop by and say hi because they know me and I know them. And, and I'm really glad I did. A gentleman by the name of Ayman or Ayman uh, was there and he was using ZBrush to create these monsters out of people. Ayman is actually the creator of something called fungosaurs, little fungal dinosaurs. And I'll put a link down in the description. You can check those out as well. But what he was doing is using an iPad and the software to scan someone. And you would turn when you got scanned and it did a, almost a, a 3D scan. He would then bring that in and use that to turn you into a zombie. It's a long process. It does take some talent to turn someone into a zombie. So Eamon was doing that and I, I hear that I will get to see that later. That was really cool and the Form Labs booth showed off their amazing detail using prints that, that just blew my mind. They did at the show release a new flexible resin that once the, once the resin cures, I believe it's uh, 60A shore hardness. Uh, they showed me in this bracelet and it was it was fantastic. I it was almost like this thing was made out of rubber bands. I was there with Jerry, you know him as Barnacle's Nerdgasm. More people I am. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you said number two. I did, number two. Ah lols, number two. Awesome. And at one point we went to the downstairs in the Las Vegas Convention Center. And as soon as we got down there, there was this eye racing simulator, which he wanted to see, but up above there was this thing called Hypervision. I saw it last year at the show and this year their booth was even bigger. It's these LEDs on a bar mounted on uh, a motor and it spins and it spins at a certain rate that allows it to convey a picture. So if you're spinning something really fast and the LEDs on this bar know exactly the color they need to be at each position, then you have yourself something capable of displaying an image. And if you pair them all together, you have something when they talk to each other that's capable of displaying a very large image. And what's really cool is everything looks three dimensional and it looks like it's floating in space and it blows my mind. On the video, it's hard to tell because you have to set your frame rate to 23.976, I believe is what it is. And my, my cameras were set to 30 or 60 or 120. Oops, but I did get some cool footage. Really, it's it's worth it to see it in person because it's just fantastic. In front of Hypervision, there was this booth for iRacing or iSim Racing or something like that. Jerry got a chance to go in this thing and it blows my mind. You, you wear an Oculus and then there's monitors so other people can see what's up there. But then you have a racing steering wheel and a racing seat and these power ramming things, moving the seat and these transducers, making it feel like you're, the bumps and everything and the, the engine revving and it, it simulates the gravity and, and the force put on you while you're driving and it slides back and oh, it was just great. I didn't get a chance to do it. Jerry did and you should have seen the smile on his face after he got out of that thing was very, very visible. <laughs> 
Stern was there showing off some new pinball machines. They had Munsters and they had Beatles. And what was really cool about the Beatles pin was that it was actually a throwback to the old style of pins where they were uh, single layer and a lot easier than, uh, than today's pins, but with digital effects and LEDs. And that was kind of cool. A company by the name of Create LED had these LED boxes. From what I can tell, they're a company that makes LED displays, but they had these boxes where each face of the box was a different LED panel, and it made this amazing visual thing. It was almost like it was giving you depth, right? Like you could see into something even though there was no depth. There was just these flat faces, but they all worked together to provide this image, and it was... It was weird. It was cool, but weird. While walking around, we did see what looked like a virtual roller coaster. This machine brought these people up, and then they had VR headsets on, and it wiggled them around a bunch. And I, I thought it was a roller coaster, but the line was long. It was a very long line to get in this thing, and I didn't want to stand in that line, so I didn't get to go in it. Omron had a booth. Omron makes, uh, I think, robots or robotic helpers or sensors or machines or something like that. They had a booth. Uh, there was a ping pong playing robot and then there was this example of almost like a robotic factory thing. So first the robotic factory thing. Uh, there was a machine that would take these parts out of a tray and drop the tray here onto a conveyor belt. And then it would move over here and drop the things onto this other conveyor belt. And it just did that over and over and over again. And when you went around to the other side of this machine, you saw this, this pick and place type robot grabbing the things that were on this conveyor belt and putting them onto trays that another machine was taking and putting on the conveyor belt. So this machine, would take one of these trays that the other side had dropped, put it on this conveyor belt, and the pick and place machine would go just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It would grab these things and then it would orient them properly until it got over here and it put them in the tray. And it just did it over and over and over. And it was just this continuous circle of awesome. And it was crazy to see. The speeds were phenomenal and it was shaking the floor it was on. <laughs> it was just, it was cool to see. Next to that was a machine that played ping pong or a robot, I guess. A robot that played ping pong. And it didn't always win, which I thought, you know, seeing this other stuff go, it's super precise. How could this thing playing ping pong not always win? Then I realized what was happening. They made sure to program it not to win to make sure us humans felt superior. That's the only thing I can think of, else that would just, just tear through ping pong players left and right. A company by the name of Jer, J-E-R, they had a chocolate 3D printer and a chocolate 3D pen. I did find out that I'm as horribly untalented with a chocolate 3D pen as I am with a normal 3D pen. But the chocolate printer itself looked like simple. It looked really simple and I found out the cost for the printer was something like $200. And it has these syringes and it's not just chocolate. You can put cakes or frostings or cheeses or whatever can go into a syringe and be slowly extruded out and have some structure to be able to hold on to itself. The 3D pen, it just looked like a 3D pen but bigger, like it held some sort of chocolatey goodness on the inside. Uh, I personally wasn't able to create anything worthwhile. Uh, my friend Stephanie and my friend Adrian were there. They were also trying it out. They were far better than I was. Regardless of how much I failed, my failure was still tasty. There was a booth by a company called Newbie Drone and I met James at Newbie Drone and I really want a drone now, an FPV drone. They look fun. They look like a lot of fun. Apparently these guys have these visor drone packages where I think it was like 200 bucks. And he was showing off something a little bit more expensive. He was flying around, he landed on my hand. He, uh, he did the circle around his head. He was just in this FPV goggle and he held onto the sticks and it was just just around his head. It was really, really cool to see. Uh, they use 3D printing a lot in the drones and the drone cases and it's, it's really cool. I, I may have to go visit them. Hey, wait, here we go, here we go. That's so cool! The folks from Ivy 3D Printer, like I said, they're the ones that provided my badge. Uh, it's, a, it's a Kickstarter 3D printer, which 
It's a Kickstarter 3D printer. But uh, I did want to go see for myself. My goal was to see models it had made and to see if it was actually running on its own. I did see both things. They did showcase the models that this machine had made. They looked great. It was very apparent this is able to produce quality models. Uh, the machine was running and it was printing PLA filament. It was printing some sort of model. I didn't get it captured on camera, but they say the motors are closed loop and I did see them knock the effector of the Delta machine, just hit it with their hand and it went out and then came back and it just kept printing right where it left off. So that's kind of cool. The models look good. I did talk with them and it looks like that machine is going to be coming to me for a few days very, very soon. Again, uh, I just want to try it out. I want to let you know what I think of this prototype, but if it works and it's good, then it might be something that you'll want to get more information on. Snapmaker was there. They were trying to show off their Snapmaker 2 platform. It's going to come in three sizes and it's going to be a very, very large machine, which is cool, but it looks like in shipping to Las Vegas, the Z-axis got damaged, so they were only able to show movements and kind of showcase the, the heads that it's gonna use and what it can do, which is really sad because it looked like a machine capable of really awesome stuff. It's the same concept of the original Snapmaker, but larger, and in fact, three sizes larger. One of the things that I thought was interesting though, I didn't see it when I was there, but Dustin tweeted that he saw a Snapmaker using their original Snapmakers with the laser burning attachment without any sort of protection around it. And that's, that's a big, big giant no-no. You really shouldn't do that, that's not safe. So I hope more companies in the future make sure that their presentations on trade show floors are safe and maybe even laser free. Ah, I got to see Nicholas and Luke from Polymaker. They were there. They had this giant kind of castle town looking thing that was printed in poly smooth and then smoothed. Uh, it looked really cool. It was really, really detailed. One of the things though, they did showcase that you do lose with poly smooth. The material can recreate high detail, but when you smooth it because of uh, the, the isopropyl alcohol smoothing the filament, you do lose some of the very fine crisp details. But what they did for miniatures, they showed poly smooth, then they showed the poly smooth miniature model smoothed, and then they showed it painted. And with painting, you can bring back some of that detail if that's what you're going for. They also at the show talked about and released their Polymax PETG. It's very similar to their Polymax PLA in that it doesn't shatter when it breaks. It bends and twists and kind of fails in that sort of way. So to show me, Nicholas took some PETG headphones that he had made and then he just bent them out. So uh, it was PETG, but it had some give and uh, I hope to get a roll of that because I really wanna, I wanna try that out. Well, CES, it's, it's over. A uh, big thanks again to Ivy 3D Printer for the badge. A really, really big thanks to Kent uh, from Haddington Dynamics who let me stay at his house. His wife and kids are wonderful people. We had a really good time. I'm really, really looking forward to being able to play with one of their Dexter arms, I think, I think right here. Maybe it could open up my fan mail or something. That'd be kind of fun. Or moving time lapses on 3D printers. There's always that. Uh, as always with CES, you never get a chance to see everything you want to, uh, and you never get to see all the people you want to. Uh, thankfully, I did run into Shannon Morse. You know her as Snubs on the everything. Uh, we did pose for a picture in front of the ANET booth, and uh, as you can see in this picture, it was on fire. How appropriate. I really hope to be at CES 2020 and I hope you're there with me to see all the goodness. But until then, we'll keep making, creating, and being awesome right here. Don't forget to hug each other more. I love you guys. As always, high five.